If you want to go ahead and pause the recording until we start. Let's see. I can see pause share, but I don't have any controls for the recording at the moment. They must have moved it. They're taking that offline. Okay. I think it's only under Abby's account since she sent this up. Oh, it must be. Oh, well. We can crop it out later.
Good afternoon, everybody. We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sean Maurer. I'm an engineer at the Smart Energy Design Assistance Center. Joining me today is my partner, Ryan Siegel. Uh, he's also an engineer with the CDAC staff. Um, be going over key items for residential plan review in the 2018 IECC uh, Energy Code. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website along with a PDF of the presentation uh, after we conclude today. Uh, controls on your screen. If you hover at the top or bottom center of your screen, you should see a controls window pop up with a QA window and a chat window option. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A window to submit your questions to us. Helps make sure that we don't miss answering any questions that come in. Uh, we do sometimes lose questions that are uh, entered into the chat window. Um, if you do enter a question in the chat window and we don't get to it, we'll try to follow up with you after the presentation. Um, same thing for the Q&A windows. If you get a question in that we uh, either don't have a ready answer for you or, or don't get the time to answer during the presentation, we will follow up with you after the presentation concludes. So thank you all for joining today's webinar. Let's get started. Um, we are offering ICC um, education credits as well as AIA education credits with this presentation. Um, simply email us your member number for AIA credits. Um, and uh, we also will be submitting certificates of completion for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, so you'll have that documentation as well. So what we're going to cover today, uh, understanding the energy code plan review practices for residential buildings, learning the best practices for documentation of residential energy code compliance, and identifying residential energy code plan review requirements. Um, and making sure that when you're submitting this documentation, you're getting through on your first pass. The Smart Energy Design Assistance Center is an applied research program at the University of Illinois. Uh, our mission is to reduce the energy footprint of Illinois and beyond. Our energy code presentation today is provided in partnership with the IEPA Office of Energy. Um, we collaborate with the IEPA to provide energy code training and technical assistance for the Illinois Energy Conservation Code. And so we'd like to thank them for sponsoring this training today. Uh, as part of our services, we provide technical support for code officials, architects, engineers, contractors, homeowners, uh, builders, um, and we have various ways for you to contact us. Um, we prefer to be contacted by email. Uh, that gives us a chance to research your question and come up with the best answer um, and talk amongst our staff. Um, but we also have a 1-800 number that you can call um, to contact us. Um, energy codes at cdac.org uh, is the email address and you can see the 1-800 number on the screen there. We also have a wide array of resources available at our website, cdac.org forward slash energy dash code. Uh, includes all our past workshops and webinars and also has available some on-demand training modules that are self-paced modules you can work your way through. Um, you can see here what that uh, support page looks like, um, links to the workshops and webinars, our online courses, and uh, the contact information for our technical support. We also have links on that page that will link you to the IECC uh, 
most current energy code. Uh, as I know many people are interested in the 2021 energy code coming out, uh, we will be updating that link on our webpage to refer to the 2021 energy code uh, once it becomes um, enforced in the state of Illinois. We also have links to the Illinois amendments. Uh, if there are amendments to the code, um, there usually are. Um, so we have the current links uh, on the web page to that information. And we also have links to the Chicago um, energy efficiency uh, code as well. Um, and that way you don't have to uh, try to remember these links or copy these down. It's a uh, quick and easy access uh, to all the most current code information. Um, today's workshop is part of a workshop series on improving compliance with the current energy codes. Um, so today we're going over residential plan review. Um, in March we'll be going over residential site inspections. And then in April and May we'll cover commercial plan review and site inspection. And then in June we'll have a kind of wrap up to the session with a energy code panel discussion uh, where you'll have open access to code officials and people that are kind of on the front lines of enforcing that energy code um, and applying it to their facilities. We also host a series of webinars. Um, in February, we will have a lessons learned webinar um, with a couple of code officials uh, going over best practices, things they've learned as they've been implementing the code, things they see out in the field. Uh, this should be a, a very enlightening um, presentation. Uh, we also have commercial lighting and commercial HVAC compliance webinars coming in March and May. So when does the energy code apply when you're um, looking at your facilities and projects. Uh, the 2015 International Residential Code um, contains a language that would trigger um, uh, when the energy code would be triggered. Um, and generally, it's when a permit needs to be pulled for your project. Um, so you can see here some examples of projects that would be exempt from a permit in general. Um, things like um, internal renovation work um, on like cabinet fixtures, window awnings, minor projects, um, kind of cosmetic things, um, minor electrical repairs and, and modifications. Um, generally, those kinds of projects will not require a permit, but it does vary from um, municipality to municipality. So check with your local building office uh, to make sure whether a permit is required or not. The next thing you need to know is whether your project is in a residential building or not. Um, per the IECC, a residential building is defined as a detached one family or two family dwelling or any building that is three stories or less above grade uh, that contains multiple dwelling units in which occupants reside on a primarily permanent basis. And in Chicago, that's been modified up to four stories instead of three. Um, so some examples, townhouses, row houses, um, apartments, um, single family homes, um, as long as they are um, Residential structures where people stay there on a primarily permanent basis. So we're excluding hotels, motels, where people are there on a temporary basis. Um, and you're under that uh, three or four story requirement, then your building qualifies as a residential structure. Otherwise, it is a commercial building. Moving into the plan review, um, in what kind of initial documentation you need to uh, have prepared in order to uh, draft that uh, plan review process. Um, <clears throat> you'll need to have in your construction documents at a minimum, uh, either on the plan drawings or in your specification documents, insulation materials and their listed R values, fenestration U factors and solar heat gain coefficients. Um, if you're following an area weighted U factor and solar heat gain coefficient compliance option, then you'll need to show those calculations. Same if you're doing um, insulation through the UA trade-off method, you would need to show that UA trade-off calculation and that it's in compliance. Uh, mechanical system design criteria, um, equipment types, uh, service water heating systems, um, sizes and efficiencies of those systems. Um, is those all determine, um, you know, the type of equipment determines the type of efficiency you'll need to uh, meet for minimum requirements. Um, equipment and system controls, duct sealing and duct and pipe insulation and locations and air sealing details. 
So what might some of that compliance documentation look like um, in your uh, drawings or in your specifications? Um, what we find is it's best for the plan review process to have a single source for all of that information in a summary table, um, <clears throat> either in the plan drawings or somewhere in your uh, specification manual that includes references to where that information can be found. Um, so you can see here installation materials, um, the specifications for those materials is in the specification documents. It's going to include um, the R values of those materials, densities, thickness, all that kind of information um, that would clutter up the plan drawings themselves. Um, the plan drawings themselves will also include listed R values on them and that's indicated by the sheet there. Um, so, but what's important to note here is that you're, you're indicating in a single location um, where in the specification manual and sheets that information is most readily accessible for the plan reviewer. Um, this also helps in developing this list in avoiding conflicting information in your documentation. Um, it's easy with specification manuals and plan drawings as you're doing updates, changing as built as um, so the project moves along um, to make changes to these things. Um, and having a table like this helps you also to verify that if you change something in one section, um, such as an insulation value, it gets updated in other areas where it's also referenced. Um, so not only is this helpful for the plan reviewer in the process, it's also helpful for managing updates in the design process. Another thing that is uh, helpful and uh, many jurisdictions include are a checklist of the compliance um, requirements for your chosen compliance path. Uh, we have an example here from the Peoria building office of a building permit application and included on that application is information on the type of foundation, uh, the type of construction for the building, um, information on the total areas of different sections of that building. Um, so you're documenting here a lot of the information you're also documenting in that um, summary table including R values um, uh, and information such as that. Um, again, having these details readily available makes filling in this application easier. Um, so as you're doing your design process and you're building out that initial summary table, um, it helps you um, if maybe you have a, uh, a checklist already um, pulled down where you can see what information do you need to include in that table. Um, and then you can make sure you cover all of this information in that uh, summary. Some jurisdictions may allow you to either skip filing, um, filling in portions of the application if the information is already provided in a similar format in your uh, spec manual or drawings, uh, but check with your building officials. Um, many of you already know the process from working together for a long time already. So. <clears throat> One of the things we like to highlight that we've seen um, with the Chicago Building Department is a, a quick check of what is your compliance path. Um, depending on your compliance path, you're going to see different compliance materials. And it's helpful to know upfront in the project for the plan reviewer and for the people doing the design process, what materials do you need to provide, uh, what reports or software might you be using, uh, so that you can have all that information readily available and it helps you get through that process in an orderly fashion. Uh, so like we can see here, there's the res check option uh, for UA trade-offs, prescriptive path, um, simulated performance method, and the energy rating index. Um, one thing we like to check here is that, you know, if the res check is a selected plan, the plan reviewer knew, knows to look for that res check report. Uh, so they're not going to be going through necessarily all the drawings and everything to find that information. That's all going to be documented in that res check report as far as R values, uh, equipment types, all that information. Um, so that can help save you some time. Um, you can even put the selected compliance method on the title sheet. Uh, of your drawings. Um, that way it's, you know, um, you've got a quick reference on the documents that the plan reviewer is going to be looking at to verify um, compliance. People should also be aware that ResCheck can be used uh, for a prescriptive path or simulated performance method um, compliance option. Um, we do like to stress that the UA trade-off is sometimes confused with a performance path. It is part of the prescriptive path 
compliance method. Um, ResCheck has added an option separately to do a simulated performance path method. Requires a little more detail on entry, um, but again, you want to make sure that you're um, checking off that compliance method um, on your um, application information and including that in your documentation. Um, the energy rating index, we also like to point out, um, is slightly different from the HERS rating. Um, the HERS program updates a little more frequently than the um, energy codes do, and so uh, their requirements may be slightly different, and thus their ratings may be slightly different uh, than the energy rating index. Uh, so just to be aware of that, if you have a HERS score for your house, that is not an energy rating index. Uh, they are slightly different. So if you are following the prescriptive path, um, and here we have an example of, you know, a quick reference from the ResCheck program for the plan reviewer, shows that that um, particular design is meeting compliance. What they would then do is go back through your documentation and verify that what you've included in your entries to ResCheck matches what's in your plan drawings. And later on in the process, when they get out to the site visit, you're gonna verify that what you designed is what you installed. Um, on the bottom screen here, you can see um, that this was using the simulated performance method for uh, ResCheck. Um, so it does call out uh, in the results pages as well as the initial settings if you're using that ResCheck program, uh, whether you're using that prescriptive path, UA trade-off path, or you're using the performance alternative. So for, for plan reviewers, that is a helpful thing to note. And so we now have a uh, brief poll we would like to launch if you could answer a couple of questions. Uh, first question is choose the residential building out of that list, a five story multifamily building, a three story hotel, a two story single family home or a one story factory. The second question is what of the following does the energy code require on construction documents? Uh, design team names, title sheet, fenestration U factor, solar heat gain, Mechanical system design information, air sealing details, or none of the above. And we'll give you all a couple of minutes to answer those. Again, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to enter those in the Q&A window and we will answer them um, as we go through the presentation. Okay, it looks like we've got a few more responses trickling in, so we'll give it a couple more seconds here. All right, so let's see how we did. Uh, for question one, looks like everyone got that one correct. The two-story single-family home is the residential building. Um, the five-story building exceeds that uh, three to four story limitation and thus that falls under the commercial provisions. Uh, the hotel, even though it meets the three story requirement, is uh, temporary housing. So it is not residential and the one story factory obviously is a commercial building. Um, as far as what's required on the construction documents, looks like most people got most of this information correct. Uh, the U-factor solar heat gain coefficients, mechanical system design criteria and air sealing details are all required um, on those construction documents. Uh, the other information is, is not required, but is often helpful to have there. So now I will uh, turn the presentation over to my colleague, Ryan Siegel, to continue on. All right, well, thank you, Sean. So as we move over here into the envelope, uh, so uh, a few things we're, we're gonna cover, and, and you'll see some of these tables will, will look fairly similar from, from one area to the next. Uh, so starting with uh, insulation uh, requirements, saying, okay, you know, where is this insulation? You know, what type of insulation is this uh, material? And, and here in the type, uh, we're, we're calling out a few of the details. Uh, 
So you can see that, you know, for the wood framed wall, we have both cavity and continuous insulation. Uh, the, the cavity insulation is a, a fiberglass with an R13. And then we've got a continuous, which is a, an XPS with, with an R5. Uh, and something that, that we do like to call out as, as a good practice is to go ahead and include the uh, code required uh, R values. So it makes a, a real quick check. So we can see in the, the ceiling here, you know, uh, our design is an R49, code is 49. So we match here. Uh, wood frame wall is a 13 plus five. So we match there. And uh, basement walls, again, calling out uh, the R value and the, the depth below ground. So uh, having the, the summary is uh, quite helpful. Uh, similarly for your fenestration. Uh, so the, the previous slide was uh, the opaque area. Now we're dealing with fenestration. So our windows and, and doors and things like that. Uh, calling out, you know, what type is it? What type of material is it? The size, uh, any projection factors uh, that, that may be uh, applicable to these areas. Uh, you know, in the various uh, assembly U factories. That's something to, to be aware of is this needs to be the assembly U factor, not the center of glass. Uh, we, we have encountered that, uh, that mistake a, a time or two uh, where people will uh, use the center of glass and not the full assembled uh, fenestration unit. For the U factor, uh, solar heat gain coefficient and visible transmittance along with the air leakage rate. Uh, and again, here you see uh, listing what the minimum uh, or maximum values uh, code allows for those. So, and then for this, uh, this project is doing a, a weighted area uh, factor for U factor and solar heat gain uh, coefficients. So uh, we're on the, the previous slide, we had the, the you know, what are the different materials and, and things like that. This is actually going through and doing the actual calculation. Uh, and so needing to make sure that we uh, are meeting the maximum uh, weighted factors uh, for that. So this does allow for a little bit of flexibility uh, as far as uh, if you do have some specialty windows or, or uh, windows where you may uh, desire to uh, have something that may be a little more decorative that may not be able to meet the uh, normal uh, U factors. Uh, so having the, this weighted area, you can uh, make up for that deficiency in that decorative window by increasing the performance of some of the other uh, fenestration around the, uh, the home. So. With this, uh, we'll, we'll touch a little more on softwares later, uh, but this is looking at the, the total UA uh, for uh, trade-off. This allows, the, the total UA trade-off allows for trading between fenestration and opaque uh, areas of a building. So if you uh, wish to have either higher performing windows and a lower performing wall or vice versa, that's perfectly fine. Uh, and so here, ResCheck again makes this fairly simple, uh, where they even provide as part of the report uh, what the allowable maximum UA is, in this case, uh, 335, versus the uh, design UA, in this case, showing a 628, uh, which is why it, it shows that this is failing using a UA trade off, because uh, 628 is greater than 335. Uh, now, as far as if uh, we were working on this design and, and this is what came up, now we say, okay, I've, I've got to address this. And so looking under my envelope assemblies and saying, you know, where do I need to really focus in on an address? Uh, you know, here, uh, the ceiling with 41, uh, the doors 12 and, and this one window of 18, you know, probably not a, a big, big place to focus on. Uh, some of the, the three larger areas, you know, the walls, okay, I, I have a really large area, so that could be a difficult area to address. Uh, 
but I also have uh, some vinyl windows showing here, uh, <clears throat> which is contributing 135. So that's that's pretty big too. And the basement walls appear to be what's really driving the the UA uh, issue in this design. Uh, so focusing on uh, where uh, where are the big areas. Uh, something else to be aware of is checking this through to see uh, does this make sense. Uh, you know, do I have some areas? Here I have uh, a particular window uh, that's showing 18 square feet, uh, saying, okay, does that make sense? I have two windows here, one is 18 square foot and uh, has a fairly poor U factor. And then most of the windows uh, in this example uh, have a better U factor of 0.3 uh, and I have 450 square feet. So uh, understanding again, this, this kind of goes back to that uh, UA trade-off and, and understanding uh, here this 18 square foot may be a decorative window, which is why it has uh, poor performance uh, for that. So focusing again your attention on, on where the majority is. Uh, so for this design, I'm going to look at my walls, uh, the, the windows, and then that basement of particular. So really trying to drive, uh, drive that up. Uh, something that I would be skeptical here, we're showing that it's 87.5% worse than code. Uh, if I did have a design submitted and it showed uh, that it passes you know, by 0.1%, I'm probably going to look at this with a fine tooth comb to, to verify that the, the values listed and the areas listed match the design. Uh, because if something just passes code, you know, squeaks by the skin of its teeth, uh, someone may have, have been uh, trying to uh, plug and chug and, and find what is that balance point that allows me to pass. Uh, and so it, it may be such where I figured out that uh, I was able to pass with windows of, of 0.3 and the actual design ended up being 0.27 because they've, they determined that I need it, you know, no higher than a 0.3 but what was implemented was was better than design uh, than actually was plugged in here. So uh, this table, uh, Sean had mo mentioned about air sealing uh, being an important factor here. Uh, air barrier construction is is very critical to the performance and particularly comfort of a, a residential home, and so uh, we do like to call out this table. Uh, R402.4.1.1, air barrier and insulation installation. Uh, so it calls out several criteria for various areas as far as what the air barrier criteria is, along with the insulation installation. Uh, so here noting under general requirements that for insulation, an air permeable insulation is not acceptable to be used as an air sealing material because it's air permeable. So it, because it passes through, it doesn't make a good seal. Uh, so if you run into a, an issue with uh, typically comfort or mold uh, or, or other uh, similar uh, problems, it is probably something addressed on this table. Uh, R402411 uh, has a lot of good detailing uh, in, in criteria. So if there's a mistake, it's probably in this table that, that you'll find the answer. So, uh, something as we're going through a, a plan review is making sure that, that we are calling out uh, where our air barrier is and actually going through and, and outlining it. Uh, here we're, we're indicating this as a red line and wherever we end up with uh, two materials coming together, you'll see we also are indicating here with uh, little red blobs you know, noting we need uh, continuous beads of sealant. Uh, sealant probably is going to be called for in the specification document as far as what that is. Uh, you know, is that uh, an acoustical sealant of some type? Is it a uh, uh, vinyl caulking? Is it a silicone caulk? Uh, what is that, that sealant? Uh, but again, where any two uh, materials meet, we need to make sure that we have addressed uh, the, the 
that discontinuity uh, through some sort of a sealing method and allow for a difference of expansion and contraction and potential shifting that may happen between those two. Uh, so uh, with that, again, over the life of the building, uh, the, the envelope, this is probably the one area that you will find is almost never replaced in the, the lifetime of a building. You know, you'll, you'll replace lighting and HVAC and the appliances. Uh, the, the envelope typically is there for the life of the building. So uh, making the envelope the best you can uh, will, will provide uh, for the, the best long-term performance and probably the long-term durability of a building uh, because good energy performance generally leads to good care and maintenance uh, and uh, durable uh, assemblies. So uh, with that, again, this is, these are some cross sections of, of walls. And again, wherever we have dissimilar materials where the drywall is meeting uh, the uh, construction lumber, uh, the lumber meeting the floor uh, around the, that band joist, and then back into the next wall down. Uh, something that we, we do see particularly on older homes uh, and for kitchens is these little drop soffits that are uh, around the cabinets. Uh, this here is actually illustrating a, a good method where the drywall is actually continuous all the way through that. Uh, and so it's, it's framed as though uh, it's, it is framed and installed prior to the soffit being installed. So that makes your air sealing much easier to accomplish. And then the soffit is installed over top. Uh, so not only does this help with your air sealing, uh, but again, that long-term, you know, when I go to renovate that kitchen, can I pull this soffit off uh, nice and easy and maybe just have to patch a few holes uh, in the, the drywall or plaster uh, and then uh, continue on with the renovation. So uh, going through and, and trying to build things uh, as independent of one another. Uh, and similarly on this right-hand graphic, you can see where the exterior wall was uh, installed continuously, and then the partition wall was built after uh, that exterior wall assembly was completed. Uh, so that way you have that continuous uh, air barrier going right through uh, for the exterior wall. So, uh, similarly, in uh, your go as you're going through, uh, is checking the air sealing details of any and all penetrations. Uh, Rarely do we see failures in the field of a wall uh, where you just have a, a nice continuous seamless uh, assembly. Generally, that's not where we run into uh, issues of buildings. It's normally wherever we have penetrations or discontinuities. Uh, so here you can see this is a uh, what appears to be a uh, either an exhaust or an intake vent. Uh, on the outside passing through this wall assembly and calling out uh, not only the uh, flashing details over the top to try to uh, again handle that that bulk water moisture uh, that may be coming down this assembly and shedding that out and away from the building uh, but also air sealing through that penetration uh, and here calling out uh, you see air sealing on the outside of this uh, and this assembly is actually using an exterior insulation uh, with, uh, so the cladding is outside, then continuous insulation, and then you have uh, your, your normal uh, uh, sheathing towards the inside. And so here we're sealing uh, at the outside for bulk water, and then the air seal is going to be here at the inside at your sheathing. So your, your sheathing here is providing your air barrier, your bulk water uh, is being towards the outside. So this is actually uh, looks to be a retrofit where you have an existing wall and they're adding exterior insulation and exterior cladding to this. So as you're going through, you wanna check for, are you making sure that you're aligning your thermal barriers and boundaries? Uh, here we can see uh, in the, the 
illustration on the left, this window has been pushed way to the outside of this, this assembly uh, and gives you a nice little uh, window stool there, which, which can be very nice. Uh, unfortunately, because you have the wall insulation towards the inside and then the window thermal break is to the outside, you end up with this uh, path where it's fairly easy to end up with uh, heat loss or heat gain transmission right through there. Uh, so you'll end up where you have a very nice window stool that you uh, potentially could sit on. Unfortunately, that's going to be very cold in the winter. Uh, so it is much better to align those thermal boundaries uh, in a single plane wherever uh, feasible to minimize that heat transfer. Uh, and again, providing for uh, an increased level of comfort here. Uh, because as uh, we are quite aware in the state of Illinois, it can get rather chilly outside. So whenever you're analyzing the uh, exterior envelope, uh, you have to be aware and, and consider we have four types of barriers that we need to be considering. We have our bulk water barrier uh, here shown in blue, an air barrier shown in red, your thermal barrier, or typically your insulation layer, uh, noting in yellow, and then uh, a vapor barrier in green. Now, some of these, your, your vapor barrier, air barrier, and water barrier may be a single, uh, single piece. Uh, so you could have uh, a, a, a house wrap of some sort that may be your uh, air barrier and vapor barrier uh, all in one. Uh, it may also be if you use uh, certain types of insulation, they may be also a thermal barrier and an air barrier in one. Uh, so you may end up where a single material can serve multiple purposes, but making sure as you're going through and reviewing this uh, and reviewing your design is have you addressed all four types? Have you addressed the bulk water, your air, your thermal, and your vapor? Uh, so. For those places, we do uh, encounter this in several locations around the state of Illinois for uh, slab edge insulation. Uh, and in particular, if you have a heated slab, making sure that you're insulating all the way underneath that, that heated slab. Where making sure that we, we do have the uh, insulation for the slab edge, it could be done in, in several different ways. On the left here is shown uh, using insulation on the exterior of the slab. Uh, the next illustration here is, is showing insulation uh, on the inside of the uh, inside of the wall and, and kind of uh, going for a floating slab type of approach. Uh, and anytime you, you see that you have a, a concrete balcony or some uh, some type of protrusion, again, you know, you now have a potential uh, issue in your uh, continuity of your thermal barrier. Uh, fortunately, the market has uh, been coming up with some new products uh, that can help provide uh, thermal breaks uh, to allow for that uh, continuity of uh, the, the thermal uh, envelope and preventing that thermal bridging from occurring uh, and can support uh, substantial uh, weight on the outside uh, of it. So with that, I, I believe we've got a, another poll here for looking at the envelope. Uh, is the weighted area U factor and solar heat gain calculation required for the prescriptive path? Looks we like we do, yeah, go ahead. we do have a, a question that came in. Let's see here. It looks like an R13 plus R5 uh, requires the foam on the exterior uh, to be taped or sealed. Uh, if that's the case, uh, looking at concerns about the vapor, uh, vapor retarder. Uh, with the uh, 13 plus five, it does not require it to be any particular type of insulation uh, or particular installation method. Uh, so 
the continuous insulation, uh, it could be a foam product uh, and the uh, taping of seams and things like that, that may depend on uh, where your air barrier is. Uh, so it, your air barrier may be uh, a material up against the sheathing and then the continuous insulation is applied over top. Uh, if your insulation is not your air barrier, uh, then you wouldn't necessarily have to uh, treat the seams as such. So uh, again, this is where it's, it's very critical that you're aware, you know, of the four purposes, uh, water, vapor, air, and thermal, what is the various lay, uh, layers doing? So uh, continuous insulation could even be a, a stone wool or, or other uh, insulation product out there too. So uh, it may just be thermal. It may be thermal and vapor. Uh, could be thermal, vapor, and air. So again, be, being aware of that. Yes, if you if you are using an R5 like XPS um, on the exterior of the wall and you're sealing those seams between that, then you would want to be able to dry to the interior as that, that foam insulation is going to create a, a kind of a vapor lock in that wall assembly if you don't. Yep. So, all right, it looks like we've got most people here. Uh, interesting, we, we are split here, uh, almost half and half. Uh, this, is, this is a little bit of a, a, a difficult question. It is, uh, do, using the weighted area U factor and solar heat gain calculation is not required by the prescriptive path. It is an option within the prescriptive path. So uh, technically you both are correct depending on what, what way you are doing. Uh, so it is, it is optional. Uh, if you're not using any, any trade-offs, you don't have to show, uh, you, you don't have to do the calculation and show it. So and with that, I'll turn it over to, to Sean for mechanical, plumbing, and electrical. All right. So first thing we're going to cover is the mechanical efficiency requirements and documentation. Um, Within the residential portion of the IECC, um, there are not internal specific um, uh, efficiency requirements within the IECC. It refers out to the federal minimum standards, which we've included a link here, uh, the Title 10 CFR 430.32. Um, but those federal minimum uh, standards are essentially 80% um, AFUE for um, gas uh, furnaces, uh, 13 sear for air conditioning, and for water heating, uh, an energy factor of uh, 0.9207. Uh, so as long as you're um, more efficient than those, that's in compliance. Um, and again, in your um, plan documents and your specification manuals, you're gonna wanna be finding those efficiencies and making sure they're documented properly for the types of systems you have installed. You're also gonna wanna document the sizing of the system um, for um, both the HVAC and the water systems. Um, the minimum requirements uh, for water heating systems, uh, that, that minimum efficiency is often determined by the size of that water heater, as that efficiency now includes standby losses as well, uh, as more uh, and more manufacturers are moving to a unified energy factor. And I believe that will be uh, incorporated into the codes as well. Um, as with the architectural summary uh, for the envelope, um, you're going to want a summary for your mechanical systems included somewhere in your mechanical schedule or uh, probably in the first page or uh, a designated area of your specification manual that has the summary of all these details of, as far as sizing uh, and efficiency requirements. Um, Another thing to be aware of is that that sizing should be um, done based on a manual J calculation and then sized appropriately based on those manual J load calculations using the manual S from the ACA design manuals. Um, we've included here just a, a brief reference um, to the manual J as far as picking your design criteria for outdoor air conditions and interior air conditions. Um, We'll go into more detail about how the manual J is actually uh, completed uh, in some other webinars in the future. Um, but it's very important that um, you're not using rule of thumb calculations and uh, 
that have been typically used in the past to try to size equipment. Because homes are so much more airtight now and more efficient, um, insulation levels have gone up significantly. Um, and the distribution of loads in the house between the envelope and internal loads like uh, electronic devices and people have changed significantly. Uh, and so these manual J calculations help ensure uh, that you're accounting for that shift in the, the load balance um, and properly sizing the equipment to handle those different loads. Um, <clears throat> as far as the system controls, it's fairly simple for residential uh, systems. Um, there's just not a whole long list of requirements like there are for commercial buildings. Um, but your control narrative for the systems would have to include a programmable thermostat narrative. Um, and that should also document the initial settings on that thermostat. Uh, as an example here, we've listed Monday nine to five, um, you know, people are expected to be out of the house at work uh, or at school. And so, you know, those temperature settings are in a setback condition, uh, 65 and 85. And then during the rest of the time when that house is occupied, um, that thermostat is set to comfort conditions at 70 to 78 degrees. Um, and you would want to document that in the, the initial settings for that thermostat. Um, even with smart thermostats that learn the schedules and temperature settings of the occupants uh, over time, uh, you do need to document an initial condition. Um, that way, if uh, the programming is ever lost on those, um, say a power outage or the battery fails on that thermostat, it can be reprogrammed back to that initial setting and then start relearning those schedules and temperature settings again. Um, <clears throat> and also this helps um, verify your design conditions for the house for your manual J uh, load calculations. Um, so if your manual J load calculation doesn't match your interior design temperature settings that you have uh, listed for um, your initial settings for your control narrative, um, then those loads aren't going to match up. So important that uh, you're cross-referencing um, that control narrative and your design criteria that's going into that manual J. Um, I did see a quick question here about the manual J. It says uh, they often see manual J or other approved method. Uh, what are the other approved methods? Um, most of what I see uh, is manual J or software that's in compliance with manual J. Um, I have not seen a lot of people using other approved methods, um, but you do have software that does load calculations such as REMRATE um, that can do um, load analysis um, based on, uh, I believe, a, a different uh, programming strategy, uh, similar to how eQuest does load sizing calculations. It's a, a DOE type model. Um, if your code official approves that kind of software, um, for that load calculation, uh, then that would be another approved method. It has to be signed off on by the code official. Um, but I, as far as I know, REMRATE is, is not a manual J approved or uh, accredited um, method. Uh, it does a, a different uh, load calculation basis. Uh, most software that has a manual J uh, basis for their load calculations have a, a stamp on the output report it says ACA manual J um, powered. Um, and so those software are specifically using the manual J block load or room by room load calculations. Uh, REMRATE uses a, a whole building analysis method uh, similar to the DOE programs for uh, eQuest and Energy Plus. Uh, okay. Uh, moving on to uh, further system control narratives. Um, if you have a heat pump planned uh, for installation in your residential building, uh, the code does require uh, that that heat pump has a control uh, in it that limits the electric backup heat from operation if the compressor can provide for the loads without that supplemental electric heat. It's just uh, eliminating that, that chance of um, kind of simultaneously heating with uh, the electric, which is gonna be uh, a lot more expensive when the heat pump, which is much more efficient, can provide that uh, heating as well. Um, 
And so your control narrative will have to document that that kind of control is in place. And usually that's built into the thermostats and things that control heat pumps these days. Um, it's fairly standard, but um, it's important to document that for compliance purposes. Another thing uh, typically seen in larger uh, multifamily residential systems uh, is if you have hot water uh, heating for space heating purposes, um, the boiler for that hot water heating system does need to have a temperature based hot water reset. Excuse me. Um, and that reset does need to be documented in your control narrative. And we included an example here um, of what kind of a, a typical reset strategy might look like where you've got a minimum temperature setting for that water and then it ramps up based on the outdoor air getting cooler uh, to a maximum temperature set point for the hot water system. Um, and this is an acceptable means of documenting those initial temperature set points. Um, it's just having that chart that documents that information. Um, but you would also need to include in your plan drawings where's the outdoor air temperature sensor located, you know, to make sure it's not uh, exposed to sunlight, uh, direct sunlight, which will impact the temperature readings uh, and possibly throw this calculation off. Um, and also um, that the boiler itself has that reset capacity built into it. So two very important considerations for those uh, kind of more advanced uh, HVAC systems than just having a furnace and AC unit. Something else important to document is the ventilation strategy for your house and the control of that ventilation system. Um, there are three different types of ventilation strategies for residential homes. Probably the most common is a negative pressure ventilation strategy where you've got a centrally located exhaust fan. Uh, usually it's in a central hallway or a central restroom in the, the home uh, that has a continuously running exhaust fan. Um, that depressurizes the house, draws in outside air through leaks in the envelope. Um, positive uh, ventilation strategy, you're going to have uh, usually it's just an outside air duct ducted into the furnace uh, or air handler fan uh, with some control dampers on it. Um, usually there's going to be a timer on that fan to ensure that uh, even in mild conditions that fan runs enough to provide the required ventilation uh, levels for the home. And then you've got the balance strategy where you've got either two fans that are exhausting and supplying air at the same rate, uh, or more common is to see an energy recovery device, a heat exchanger, uh, to recover the energy on that air. Since it's going in and out on a continuous basis, um, there's a lot of benefit for the homeowner um, as far as long-term energy consumption to have that heat exchanger in place uh, to recover the energy within their home and meet that ventilation requirement. Uh, so things to check and document um, within the plan drawings, um, the type of system, where those fans are located, uh, the control switches for those fans, they need to be readily accessible to the occupants. Um, what the control strategy for that fan is, is it going to run 24 seven or is it going to run uh, at least 25% of a four hour period? So one hour out of every four. Um, those are all acceptable control strategies for that ventilation system, uh, but they do need to be documented. And if you do have an intermittent ventilation system, um, which we do see um, somewhat more commonly, um, then you need to document that the airflow ventilation rate uh, is appropriately increased so that uh, you meet the time average requirement of ventilation if that system are running 24 seven. Uh, so if you do run one out of every four hours, you're instantaneous ventilation rate for that fan would be four times higher than if it ran 24 seven uh, for ventilation purposes. Um, location of those fans for maintenance purposes, locations of the switches um, for shut off and maintenance um, and operation uh, for the homeowners. Um, all that information needs to be documented uh, for those ventilation systems. So all things to be aware of and include in those construction documents and the specification manuals uh, where appropriate. Another thing important to document um, is duct sealing. Um, what we find a lot with um, insulation ductwork is that the plan drawings just show the location of the ductwork um, and sizing of the ductwork, but usually doesn't show details on where to seal, how to seal. Um, 
typically that information is relied on the HVAC installer to know those things uh, from other reference manuals. Um, it would probably be beneficial since uh, duct sealing is required for all ductwork systems now. Um, to have just a few details added into your plan drawings to ensure that that ductwork system is going to be properly sealed um, and properly insulated. Um, we've included here just an example from a, a flex duct uh, assembly uh, manual uh, showing different uh, ways to connect the flex duct together um, and ensure that not only is that going to be properly airtight and sealed, but that that joint is also going to last um, for the life of that home. Uh, another thing uh, to be sure is included in the plans is duct sealing boots, uh, the duct boots to the registers or penetrations, particularly if you have a uh, ventilated crawl space or the ductwork is coming down from an attic space. You want to make sure that that air sealing detail uh, is appropriate around that ductwork uh, between that unconditioned space and the conditioned area that you're supplying air to. Um, and again, it's, it's not a detail we see a lot in plan drawings. It's generally relied upon the contractor to know that that air sealing needs to be done. Um, so and, and just another uh, minor detail to add in um, to make sure that, that you're not going to have large air gaps or um, losses from that ductwork into that unconditioned space or drafts from that unconditioned space into the conditioned area. And just an example of what that might look like on a plan drawing. Um, this is a, just a, an overhead view of some ductwork in an, uh, an attic space. Um, and we've included a summary table here of the, the duct insulation requirements and then just tacked on to the drawing, uh, those labels for that duct insulation. Um, so on the plan drawings, you can see the main trunk's about a 12 inch diameter going down to uh, three and four inch diameter branch ducts. Um, and so going back to this table and referring to uh, the proper insulation levels in that attic space for that insulation. Um, if that ductwork were split, like say you had attic return with supply on the floor, um, then you would have different um, insulation requirements for those. Um, so just an example of what it might look like on a plan drawing to label that information uh, for the ductwork. Um, it would be I think easiest to include a summary table of the location of the ductwork and the code required uh, insulation levels for the size of ductwork and that location. And then just do a, a quick uh, reference note on the plan drawing, referring back to that table. We did have a question come in about the HVAC systems before I move on to plumbing. Um, a person planning a small residence with electric baseboard heating, any suggestions on addressing required ventilation as there is no air system? Um, you do most likely still have restroom exhaust fans. And in that situation, I have seen restroom exhaust fans that have a high speed and a low speed setting. Um, the low speed setting provides that continuous ventilation for the space and the high speed setting is for, you know, someone goes in, uses the rest, restroom, flips on the switch, uh, then it ramps up that exhaust air um, to the higher speed to uh, take care of, you know, shower, um, humidity or, or odors from using the restrooms. Um, that's probably the most common way that I've seen that ventilation uh, handled for, for homes that don't have a central fan system. Moving on to our plumbing plan review. Um, another thing to uh, that we see with plumbing is that uh, for hot water piping, there are certain areas that have insulation requirements. Um, also for mechanical piping for uh, AC units. Um, if your mechanical system is gonna be carrying a fluid that's gonna exceed 105 degrees Fahrenheit or be cooler than 55 degrees Fahrenheit, that piping should be insulated um, throughout the home. Uh, typically this applies to hot water tank lines, three quarter inch or larger um, near the hot water tank. Um, typically not um, 
seen at the actual connections from the hot water circulation system or delivery uh, loop to the fixtures? Uh, is there a small enough diameter that insulation requirements are not, um, insulation's not required? Um, but one of the things we see is that even though insulation notes are on the plans, um, where you've got joints or elbows or bends in that uh, piping insulation, um, it would be helpful to see details on proper insul installation of that insulation so that it isn't going to degrade over time. Um, an example picture shown here of miter joints on some EPDM foam insulation uh, is that typical wrap around and kind of tacked together uh, with a glued seam um, pipe insulation. Um, if those joints aren't mitered on that type of insulation, then you get compression of the insulation on one side and stretching of it on the other um, that degrades its insulation performance and over time can lead to that insulation splitting along that glued seam um, or the stresses can allow that insulation to uh, pull apart over time, uh, especially if it dry rots in the future. Um, these joints help relieve those stresses and ensure that that insulation isn't compressed or stretched or otherwise degraded in its performance so that you're getting the full R value along the entire length of your piping system. Another thing to be aware of, if you choose in your residential structure to have a hot water circulation or demand circulation system, uh, the Energy Code does include specific language that those systems should be controlled based on a demand for hot water and then turn off based on differing requirements for the different types of loops. So again, um, one of the things to be aware of here is that since there is that demand requirement, you're now gonna have a control narrative that you have to document in your plan drawings or in your specification manual, and you're gonna to have to document the controls used to manage that system. Where are they located um, and how are they controlling the system? Uh, so very important to be aware of. Uh, typically see these in larger homes, um, and it can be one of the more difficult sections to be in compliance with. Um, one help that we would recommend is to call out where the pump is located for a circulating system um, and mark it on the plan drawings. Uh, for demand control recirculation, um, it's likely to be easier to implement that uh, as a demand component can be uh, determined from interaction of a user using a push button or low voltage switch. That switch location is typically towards the end of the loop uh, to ensure that uh, you get circulation throughout the, the entire uh, distribution system. Um, but you wanna be sure that, again, that's documented on the plan drawings. Where is that sensor at? What's controlling that loop? And where is your circulation pump? Um, something else to be aware of on your plan drawings for a, a circulating loop that has a, uh, a dedicated hot water return line um, is the location of the flow sensor for that loop controlling that. Uh, we have seen instances in the past where that flow sensor is somewhere on the hot water line, but as soon as that pump turns on and that sensor detects flow, it's always going to detect flow because that pump's going to continually circulate water. Um, the pump won't ever get a signal to turn off that the demand itself has gone away. So that um, flow sensor should be on the cold water inlet line to the hot water tank. That way, only when hot water is drawn from the tank will that sensor then detect flow for the replacement cool water coming in, and then that activates the pump to do your circulation. Um, another thing to note is the location of the temperature sensor that's controlling those loop temperatures. Um, for the dedicated hot water circulation loop, um, once you start drawing hot water um, to turn the pump on, uh, the pump's going to turn off once you reach your desired loop set point, which should happen relatively quickly after shutting off the hot water. Um, so the best place to locate that temperature sensor is out in the loop close to your furthest or second furthest uh, appliance. That way you're ensuring that that hot water is actually reaching out to those um, appliances. And the last thing to touch on is plan review for electrical documentation. This is a really, really short section in the energy code. Essentially states that you should be using LED lighting for <laughs> compliance. Um, in the energy code specifies that um, 
high efficacy fixtures should be used um, in 90% of fixtures in the facility or in the home or, or residential structure. Um, and so note, first of all, that uh, that 90% is based on a fixture requirement, not a bulb count requirement. So if you have a fixture that has four bulbs in it, uh, you're not going to count those individual bulbs and then uh, base your percentage off of that. Uh, you're going to be counting the individual fixtures themselves. Um, <clears throat> what we've included here is just a summary table, uh, including uh, the lumens per watt for all the fixtures uh, installed in this particular residence. And they've calculated out what percent of the total that is. They do have a couple of fixtures that have um, non-compliant lumen per watt uh, values. Um, they're too low to be high efficacy fixtures, but they are less than 10% of the overall fixture count. And so this is still a compliant um, uh, lighting system. So very helpful to have those fixture counts in a summary table. Um, that way your plan reviewer just has a quick reference. Yep, everything checks out, um, good to go. Uh, so something to be aware of, um, the Illinois amendments have uh, change the definition of high efficacy from what's in the 2018 IECC. Um, the, the efficacy is 55 uh, lumens per watt for individual lamps and 65 lumens per watt for uh, fixtures. Um, so be aware that that 90% is based on a fixture count in the home. We just had that question uh, come in again. So when you're looking at your high efficacy fixtures, you're gonna count up all the fixtures in the residence. 90% um, or more of those fixtures have to be a high, have to contain a high efficacy lamps. Um, so don't count the individual bulbs, count the fixtures themselves. And then we do have another poll question on the, uh, question is, are time-based hot water circulation controls allowed? And we'll let that go for a few seconds. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask those in the Q&A window. And just to just to reiterate, uh, going back to that earlier question about you know what is uh, another approved method for a load calculation, uh, that'll that'll go back to the definition of approved, which is acceptable to the code official. So if you're looking to use something other than a manual J, reach out to your code official and see if they will they will approve it. Uh, they they you know. That's one, one advantage that the code does give is uh, the energy code does provide a, a fair bit of latitude as far as, you know, what is, what is acceptable for the code official. You know, they may have seen uh, several, different, uh, uh, several different methods out there and say, yep, that, that gives good enough results. Well, we can, we can go ahead and use that. Hey, looks like we've got most of our answers in for our poll question. Um, it was a little bit split, but it looks like um, we, we had a little confusion on this one. Time-based circulation controls are not allowed per the code. Um, they do have to be demand-based. So it has to be a sensor in the space that picks up an occupant if you're doing a demand-based system or a flow sensor if you're doing a, a circulation system. Those controls uh, do need to be sensing some sort of hot water demand in the space. Um, so a time-based control is not allowed. We did have a question, uh, are high efficacy and LED bulbs the same? Um, in general, most LED lighting will be high efficacy. Um, we did do kind of a brief market study, went out and checked. Um, and we did find that there are some LED fixtures that are not high efficacy. Um, they tend to be the, the higher price designer fixtures, um, actually. Um, but for the most part, uh, if you're using LEDs, most of those are going to qualify as high efficacy. Um, but again, it goes back to that lumen per watt definition uh, that's in the Illinois amendments. 
uh, 55 lumens per watt for bulb, 65 lumens per watt for a fixture. Uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Ryan to go over our software compliance options. Terrific. Uh, just so people are aware, that was actually reversed. Oh, sorry. 50, 55 is, is a fixture, 65 for a, a, a lamp. So the bare bulb is, is 65, a fixture is 55. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it's something like 85% of the market uh, was, was qualified as high efficacy. So uh, not generally something we run into too many, uh, too many issues with. But. Uh, as far as our software compliance, uh, so here's where we're going to talk uh, a little bit about Manual J and, and some of these uh, others as well. Uh, first, starting with ResCheck, uh, one thing that ResCheck uh, does do that, that makes things fairly easy is uh, as part of their uh, reporting is they provide and spit out uh, these checklists as far as uh, verifying compliance. Uh, so it'll uh, go through and say, you know, here's here's what it is, and so you can just go through and, and check and, and uh, check off the compliance. Uh, it also provides some of this where you say, okay, does this, you know, is it is it in compliance, or I will comply at the time it's installed, and, and things like that. So, uh, ResCheck does uh, does make a, for a very nice checklist as as it goes through. Uh, Sean had, had touched on earlier as far as uh, rules of thumb and why these these really cannot be done anymore. Uh, you know, it, it used to be the standard was, you know, 500 to 600 square foot of, of cooling. Uh, this was a study that uh, one firm did uh, of various designs. As you can see, there was one home that was close to this out of the, I believe there's something like 30 uh, homes that were studied as part of this uh, analysis. You know, many homes are, are you know, 1,000 to 1,500 square feet, particularly with uh, current codes. Uh, I know I, I looked at uh, my home recently. Uh, I, I live in a, you know, almost 100 year old home. It has had some insulation done and, and you know, typical replacement vinyl windows at some point. Uh, and even it is, you know, uh, just over 700 square feet uh, per ton of cooling. And you, you figure that's 100 year old home, there's not really air sealing involved. So uh, yeah, you're gonna find, uh, if you're near that 500 square foot in your calculation, something is, is skeptical there. Uh, also, as, as we kind of touched on earlier, uh, going through the, the system design, making sure that we are doing a, a manual J or some other equivalent load calculation, uh, and then selecting our equipment based on that, uh, typically using a manual S or uh, other approved method. Uh, commonly, that's that may just be uh, whatever the next available size from the manual J load is. Uh, and then the energy code does not call out a manual D duct sizing. However, the residential code does call that out as a requirement. Uh, so you should be doing your load calculation, then sit, uh, and then picking your equipment, and then appropriately sizing your ductwork. Uh, and the critical thing uh, of sizing ductwork allows and ensures that the uh, required airflow actually reaches the various spaces. Uh, and so uh, a real issue we have encountered is, you know, oversizing heating equipment uh, is less of an issue. Uh, it, it causes fewer problems than oversizing cooling equipment. Uh, but a manual J will do both cooling and heating. Uh, and so by properly sizing equipment, typically smaller than would have otherwise been used, not only does it, it uh, can it reduce first uh, initial construction costs, but also your comfort. You know, if you have a, a furnace that's oversized and so it turns on and then turns off and on and off. And so you get this blast of hot air and then it gets cold, and then a blast of hot air. Uh, that can really have some comfort issues 
Uh, and then indoor air quality, particularly if you're oversized on uh, cooling, uh, because you don't get that dehumidification that, that is important uh, on the cooling side. And so you can end up with indoor air quality and mold issues due to that. Um, and obviously dur building durability uh, and energy efficiency. Uh, so, and for, for builders out there, you know, if you end up with higher customer satisfaction, uh, that's likely to lead to more referrals uh, and fewer callbacks. Uh, so wanting to make sure that we get this right the first time. Uh, for those of you who are reviewing manual J's or even doing manual J's, making sure that you're using the correct outdoor design conditions. Uh, here in the state of Illinois for cooling, uh, we have a design condition in the summer of somewhere between 88 and 93 degrees. Uh, this is not the hottest temperature you will ever see in a year, uh, but this is looking at 99% uh, of the year it will be uh, below this. So 1% you might be a, a little bit above this. Uh, however, again, this is for manual J, so this is our, our actual loading. Uh, and so manual S is going to take care of some of this uh, because the probability that you're going to come up with a manual J of, I need exactly 60,000 BTUs of, of heating uh, is probably not, not going to be there. So you might come up with, it says, I need 50,000. The next size furnace is going to be 60. And so I already have some, some room just between the manual J and the manual S. Uh, but so yeah, for, for cooling, uh, design conditions here in the state of Illinois between 88 and 93 on the heating side between negative 4 and 10. Uh, so if you see a manual J and it says 100 degree cooling temp, that's wrong. Uh, and, and similarly in the winter, if I see a negative 10, because polar vortex, we might get negative 10. Nope, not acceptable. So. Uh, this is a look at uh, the speed sheet put out for uh, free by the ACCA, A-C-C-A. Uh, and so uh, going through and saying, okay, I've picked, you know, Champaign-Urbana, uh, and it goes ahead and fills in my outdoor conditions, which is kind of nice that that's built in. And then what is my design indoor conditions? Uh, this goes back to what Sean mentioned earlier about having your uh, initial thermostat settings documented. So if the, the thermostat settings, uh, you know, have set points of, you know, 65 and 78, and here on the form I show 70 and 75, that's not a match. This was not done per the uh, specifications. Uh, so making sure that, that these two match uh, between what was the design and what was specified. So. Here we are looking at the, well, as we move down and look at the windows and glass. Uh, so here I've, I've kind of extracted the heating and cooling uh, from that table here for the various directions. Uh, so I tried to blow that up a little bit. And what we see is on the heating side, it's mostly based on is this single pane or double pane windows. Uh, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of difference between the directions. So my north facing windows and my east and west facing windows are pretty close to one and the same, you know, 37.4, pretty much across the board, uh, 37.4, 37.3, right in there. Uh, now the single pane window stands out, uh, jumps right out at 86. So it's, it, that single pane window is a much, uh, much heavier heating load uh, than it is. So the, the direction doesn't matter as much in the heating side. In the cooling side, you see here, it really jumps out as far as direction is what really plays a big role for cooling. Uh, east and west windows are very heavily loaded. Uh, north and south, not as much. Uh, and here you can see, uh, again, the, the double pane uh, does, does give you a little bit of benefit over the uh, single pane, but it's, it's not quite as dramatic as it was on the heating side. So uh, something to be, be aware of as you're going through here and, and when you're picking your windows. Uh, so uh, when you're selecting windows, uh, 
for heating, it really makes a, a huge impact as far as your, your performance. Uh, you know, do you go single pane or double pane or triple pane, argon, low E, all of the, the different things there. So, uh, and here in the state of Illinois, again, we're, we're very heating dominated. So uh, making sure that you, you pick that uh, can really be good. Something else as you're going through and reviewing this is checking to make sure that all the boxes are filled in. Uh, this was uh, one thing that we, we noticed was, uh, you know, it was a, a little unusual in that something something looked a little, little out of place. And uh, what we picked up on was hadn't filled in the form fully. Uh, we ended up with some blank spaces as far as the, the uh, heating and cooling floor area uh, above grade. And so we ended up with because those hadn't been filled in, it showed no cooling BTUs. Uh, and so making sure that we uh, go through and, and fill in everything. Uh, something else to be uh, very cognizant of is in these manual J's for nearly all homes built today, uh, and, and even really for probably the past five to 10 years, it is going to be considered a tight home. Uh, Average construction is not average today. Uh, this is this is average over the last century, and so because we actually do uh, we do go through uh, and, and verify our, our envelopes are tight. Uh, any manual J calculation, you should uh, the the envelope leakage rate should be tight, uh, should not be average. So. Uh, with that, I believe we do have one final polling question here. Uh, so we're going to do some uh, launch a poll here. As far as what air sealing details need to be construct need to be included in the construction documents. So where do I need to make sure that I've air sealed the building envelope, the air ducts, the plumbing, insulation, and lighting. So, this is a little bit of a, a difficult question here. Uh, here we, we have a question as far as uh, design temperatures. Uh, someone is, is calling out that the Chicago code may be looking, uh, may have a requirement to use negative 10 for winter design temperature. Uh, I can't say for certain, I, I'm not, versed in the Chicago code specifically. Uh, so they may have their own uh, specific design criteria, uh, in which case go ahead and, and use their specific design criteria. Um, now something, again, what this kind of goes back to is, uh, you know, the difference between a manual J and a manual S. Uh, so manual J, even if you size it to the uh, negative four degrees, uh, that I think may be found in the in the ASHRAE tables, uh, it may say negative four degrees. Uh, the difference between negative four and negative 10 will likely be accommodated by uh, the system size selection. So your your next size up will probably buy you that, that buffer. Uh, and probably what you'll find is if you plug in negative four and then you go back and plug in negative 10, your sizing probably won't change between the two. Uh, and the ACA manuals actually do specify that you use your either the design criteria in their weather tables or your local code office required design values. So they do provide um, language in the ACA manual J that you should use um, any locally required um, values over what's required in the, uh, the manual J itself. Um, and then we have another question about having done a manual J, there are a lot of fields uh, to do entry in. It's, it's easy to enter skewed values or make an honest mistake. Um, is there a technique uh, for validating those? Um, there is a list of kind of like primary things to check um, that uh, ACA has published. 
um, and I don't require all the fields right off the top of my head, but I think it's only like 10 fields to check. Um, the primary one being the design temperatures, making sure that those are correct, uh, because those will have the greatest impact. They'll, they'll affect all the other values underneath them. Um, so the design temperatures, making sure those are correct is a big one. Um, making sure the areas of surfaces are correct um, is usually an easy cross-reference between plan drawings and, and the entries in the field. Um, if you see um, a window that happens to be almost the same size as a wall or something, it could be a decimal place error or something like that. But um, those are the ones coming to me off the top of my head. Um, and we are working on some manual J um, education materials and we'll, we'll go into detail on those there. Uh, I'm going to end our poll. Looks like most everyone is answered. So we'll go ahead and share those results. Okay. Uh, building envelope air sealing, definitely. Uh, duct sealing, yes, we definitely need to do that. Uh, plumbing sealing, uh, plumbing really doesn't get into air sealing. That would be more the, the building envelope. Uh, insulation, uh, generally not, because uh, unless the insulation is part of your air barrier. Uh, and then lighting, if you have lighting that is in the envelope, uh, so in that, that uh, air barrier, uh, then you would have some, some sealing there. But yes, our primary two are the, the envelopes and ducts. So people, people picked up on that pretty good. Oh. Have a question here about uh, calculating outdoor air for an air handler. Uh, should the direct exhaust, such as uh, toilet exhaust, be included in the total outside air? Uh, or uh, toilet exhaust can be exhausted only from the space and don't have to include. Uh, so, uh, again, this is where uh, being, being cognizant of your balance, uh, we don't generally uh, see too much in the way of uh, uh, if, if you're indicating here, as far as the question being about using uh, positive pressure uh, or using the, the air handler to pull in your outside air for your ventilation rate, uh, it, if it requires the uh, toilet exhaust to be running in order to provide the appropriate amount of outside air, then you do need to have some control correlation or coordination uh, between uh, between those two. Uh, so again, part of that may depend. Uh, most designs that we have seen, if you place just the, the outdoor air inlet as part of the, the return air coming into the air handler, uh, most of the time we see the air handler fan used as the ventilation means, uh, rather than relying on, on a bathroom, uh, bathroom exhaust for that. Um, and in the ventilation requirements are referred to tables in the, uh, the IRC, uh, and those tables base that ventilation uh, on the number of rooms plus one, assuming that the master bedroom is going to have uh, a couple in it, and the other rooms will have a, a child each. Um, and so those ventilation requirements are, are based on a continuous ventilation requirement. They are not including intermittent uh, exhaust ventilation, such as kitchen hoods, and bathrooms and things. So when you're calculating your total outside air requirement, um, you may want to put in a little bit of uh, a buffer um, to allow those systems to uh, adjust a bit uh, based on those exhaust rates. Um, typically where we see this question come across is how do you balance uh, an HRV's fans or ERV's fans? Um, and making sure that you're not depressurizing the house with, say, a large kitchen hood that runs intermittently. Um, and usually that does not need to be accounted for in that type of system. You're accounting for that continuous ventilation requirement based on the, the occupancy in the house. Those intermittent exhaust loads usually aren't included in that, um, assuming that the pressure will balance out from leakage through the envelope. That is something we didn't we didn't touch on today, but being aware uh, because it's not in the energy code, it's it's in the mechanical code. Uh, but if you do have uh, exhaust uh, requirements, uh, particularly kitchen hoods, uh, you know above 400 
cubic feet a minute, then you do have to provide a dedicated outdoor air uh, unit and makeup air unit for those uh, for those heavy exhausts. And yes, yeah, so as Sean kind of mentioned, those those intermittent small exhaust fans uh, shouldn't shouldn't really uh, shouldn't cause you you consternation over over your your nominal ventilation rate. Well, we would like to thank everyone for joining us today. If there are no further questions in our question tool, um, if you do have questions, please feel free to follow up energycode at cdac.org or call us at that 1-800 number. We'll be glad to help you as best we can. Thank you.